so yeah, so this is okay. So this is joint work with a couple of people. Some of them are here, and some of them should be here, but they're stuck because their flight was cancelled. Uh, so it's with uh, AJ, who is stuck because the cancelled flight. Uh, Ilya Chevere, who probably can't be here because of baby. Um, <coughs> And uh, also how <coughs> um, so so this is about young males um, in two D. So I'm only going to I'm only going to talk about two D today. Um, and so yeah, so I should first explain because presumably uh, most of you don't know what young males is. And I didn't know what Young Mills is two years ago, so. Um, so here the so the basic object if you want, okay, so Young Mills is kind of a quantum field theory. Okay, so for a quantum field theory, you want something like an action. So for example, in the case of phi 4, the action would be uh, right, so in phi 4, probably most of you do know about, and there the action is something like integral gradient phi square plus phi 4. Right? So you want some kind of an action, and then once you have an action, there's a natural measure that goes with it, which is sort of formally e to the minus the action. Uh, and there's also a natural dynamic, which would be some sort of functional dynamic that has that measure as invariant measure. Uh, and so we want to basically carry that kind of program through for young mills. Uh, so in the case of Young Mills, so in the case of 5.4, the basic object here is essentially just a function, like a real valued or maybe complex valued or something, a function from the underlying state space into R or C or maybe R. Um, in the case of Young Mills, the basic object is actually a connection. Um, and if you want the, uh, the basic space you start from, is uh, what's called a G principal bundle. What this means, so what does that mean? So it means essentially, intuitively, what it means is you have a manifold M, so that's your configuration space. In our case, this is always going to be the two dimensional torus. Um, and then at every point, you essentially attach a copy of some Lie group G. Okay, so G is going to be a compact Lie group, so think of it as being S O N or something like that. Um, so the idea is to attach, you know, like a copy of G at every point, right? Except that what you attach at every point is not quite a copy of G. It's essentially like a copy of G which you've forgotten which element is the neutral element, right? <coughs> so in the sense of, for example, you know, think of S1. So you can think of S1 as being complex numbers with modulus 1. And then there's a clear multiplication rule, because you can multiply two complex numbers, and it's clear which one is the neutral element, <coughs> because that's 1, right? But then on the other hand, you can also think of S1 as actually just being the circle, and then if you think of it as being the circle, then there isn't really any point which is distinguished on the circle, right? So it doesn't really make much sense of thinking that, oh, that point 1, 0 is somehow more special than the point 0, 1, or than any other point on the circle, right? Uh, and so in that sense, if you think of it as being the circle, then it's still clear what it means to multiply by a complex number, right? Because it's sort of in some sense, the S1 as a group still acts on S1 as a circle by rotation. Right? It's clear what it means to rotate by zero degree or by a certain angle. Okay? Uh, but there's no point on the circle which is distinguished anymore. Right? So that's the idea. So a, so a principal bundle is essentially a space, something like, okay, formally you have a manifold with a projection, uh, and so that like every fiber uh, is essentially a copy of G, but it's it's a copy of G of which you've forgotten where the neutral element is. Okay. In other words, you don't have a canonical section. Okay. So there's no 
So at every point of M, there is this fiber, which is like a copy of G, but that fiber doesn't have a distinguished point. Okay. And so that means, in particular, that, for example, if you, if you, take, a, uh, if you take a point here, and then you, you see, you want to do things like this, which is like take a curve in M, Right, so that's a curve in the underlying configuration space M. Okay, so that's in M. Uh, and then you want to lift it um, into a curve on the whole bundle. Right, so the bundle, let's call it P. Right, so P would be really the whole bundle, which you think of as something M with a copy of G attached at every point. There's a projection which projects give all the fiber to the actual point M. And now you want to sort of undo that projection, which means, you know, you have that starting point here, at this point there's sort of like a copy of G attached. So you lift it to some element in that fiber. Right? So you have to choose an element in the fiber here. And then you ask yourself, you know, what's a natural way of now lifting the whole curve. Right? So I choose where I want to lift the starting point. So this is an arbitrary choice. I just choose one guy in the fiber. There is no distinguished guy, right? Because there isn't a neutral element. So I just choose a guy in the fiber here. Uh, and then you ask yourself, is there a natural way of somehow lifting this curve to P? Well, in such a way that, of course, at every point it sort of projects down to the curve that you started from. And for this, you need a priori. The, the answer is no. So there's no, in the absence of any other structure, there is no canonical way of doing that, simply because these copies of G, they are not canonically identified with each other. Right? Because they don't have, sometimes they are right? they kind of only modular rotations. And so you need what's called a connection. So essentially, the connection tells you how you kind of lift this. Um, and so what you can think of it is, well, imagine you choose a coordinate system. Now, choosing a coordinate system would essentially mean, at least locally, writing P as, you know, M times G. But the thing is that there's no canonical way of writing P as M times G, right? So it's like for each of the fibers, you have to somehow choose in which way you identify it with G. Uh, and so that's not canonical. But, you know, say you might have like a structure of, say, differential manifold or something like this. So at least, maybe it's not canonical, but at least you sort of know what it means to have a smooth choice or a continuous choice or maybe differential choice or something like that. Right? So you may take a sort of nice coordinate system where nice is sort of up to you to decide what it means. Um, and so you have a way of identifying what P was basically n times g, but that's not canonical, right? Um, so now, of course, if you have this, right, then there would be kind of a trivial way of lifting the curve, right? Because you have your coordinate system like that. If you start with a curve in M, and now you choose a point in the fiber here, which simply means you choose an element of g for the starting point of the curve, and you say, well, okay, it's trivial, I just keep that element constant, and you know, that's it, that's my way of lifting. Uh, but of course that depends, now if you choose a different coordinate system, well, it gives you a different way of lifting. Right? And so this is not at all canonical because it depends completely on how you actually choose your coordinate system. Uh, and so you want to have a more intrinsic way of doing it. Right? And so the intrinsic way of lifting it, that's precisely what's called a connection. Um, and then, you know, assuming that you've already written things in coordinates, okay, well, what does the connection have to tell you? Well, it has to tell you by how much the way that you want to lift things should differ from, if you want, the trivial way, where, which is where you would just keep that element constant, right? And so that means, what does it mean? So it means at every point, what you have to do? Well, you look at you know in which direction the curve moves. Okay, so you move in a certain direction 
down in the manifold M. Okay? Um, and then you have to decide up there in which direction you want to move the lift. Right? So now, of course, for the M component, you have no choice. You have to follow the curve. So the only choice that you have is the G component. Uh, and if you want everything to remain smooth, well, you have to sort of move by an element in the tangent space. Okay? And the tangent space of G, sort of at any point, you can always identify it with the uh, the algebra. Okay? So, so what it tells you is that a connection is really something which for every direction at every point assigns an element of the D algebra. Right? Because then that gives you a way of lifting these curves. Uh, so in a way, a, a, a connection is a sort of G value one form. Right? Because a, a one form is a thing that, given the tangent vector, spits out a number, and while well, a g valued one form is something that, given the tangent vector, spits out an element of g. Okay. Yeah? When you go around the doubles, do you want to end up at the same point where you start? Very good question. No. <laughs> and that, that, is, <laughs> that is the main point. Exactly. So, so such a connection, right? So here, connection is an arbitrary g-value one form. And exactly as Milton pointed out, this may ver very well have the property that if you take a closed curve here and then you lift it, well, there's no reason a priori that you actually end up where you started from. Right? So when you lift that curve, it may well be that sort of you, you end up doing a loop like this. And you end up, well, you have to end up in the same fiber, but you might end up, you know, at a different element in the fiber. Okay? Um, okay, good. So that's the basic uh, object here. So now, remember, again, um, we want to really think of these copies of... So in terms of physics, if you want, right? What you should think of is that M is something like the actual configuration space. It's like, you know, space-time. G is some sort of internal state. It's something that kind of describes, you know, it's the sort of thing that, for example, commutes the flavors of the quarks and stuff like that. Right? So it's sort of like some kind of internal state. Um, and you should think of the laws of nature as being sort of symmetric under changing by an element of G. And so the only way that you can, in some sense, extract any kind of information on that, since the laws are completely uh, symmetric, is precisely by these kind of procedures, where you somehow lift the curve, you go around somewhere, and you realize that you don't quite end up where you started from. Yeah. Um, anyway, so, so here there's a natural symmetry group, right? Because we... Since we've decided that you know, there's absolutely no canonical choice of origin for, for G at any point, uh, it means that we have a natural symmetry group, which is a curly G. Right? So curly G would be functions. Right? So that would be, say, the set of functions uh, little g from M to G. And I'm on purpose vague about any sort of regularity that these functions might have. You want probably at least continuous. Okay, but so, so you have a group curly G, which is some kind of symmetry group for this whole construction. Right? Which is the, well, okay, you can sort of imagine how it acts on that. Basically, at every point, uh, you act by multiplication of the, with the corresponding element of, uh, of G. And so the idea is that you want all of the quantities, so in some sense all of physics should be invariant under the action of that big symmetry group. Okay? So you're only interested, so in some sense the physical quantities are only quantities that are invariant under the action of that group. Okay? So, so that's a similar, similar thing of, you know, so, so for example, take a, take a ball. And now, I take a ball with a picture drawn on it. Okay, so I have a picture, I don't know, 
person here drawn on the ball. Okay? And so now I have a, a second ball with a picture like that. So I have my second ball. I think clearly you would think, well, that's the same ball, right? I mean, if I give you the two balls, well, they're clearly the same ball. I mean, I turned that one around, it's not the same ball. It was just handed to you in a different way, right? Um, and so, even though, right, so in these two situations, if you want to describe, you know, the picture could be described by, you know, a function from the sphere into whatever, some space of colors, um, as functions from the sphere into a space of colors, if I draw it like this, this would be two different functions. Right? One of them would maybe be, you know, red at the point, whatever that is, whereas this one would not be red at that point. Okay? But obviously you think of them as being the same ball. Uh, and so clearly here you have a symmetry group that acts on that space of functions, which is simply rotations of your ball, and you want to identify two functions that differ only by an, act by an action of that symmetry group. Right? So physically, you don't think of that ball as being any different from that. Right? It's clearly the same one, just handed to you in a different way. Yeah. That's what is it, it is called gauge free. Right. So this is this is called the gauge group. Exactly. Well, or this is. Yeah, this is usually called the structure group, this is called the gauge group. Okay. Um, but you see, the group that you choose is not completely determined, if you want, by the situation you have. Because, for example, if this ball was something like the Earth, okay, then this, the Earth is a little bit different, right? Because the Earth, it's not just a ball, it's a spinning ball, right? So the Earth is a ball that actually has an axis of rotation and kind of spins around it. Right? And so now if I do these as two Earths, then they're actually different. Right? Because that guy is not the same as that guy. You know, I can't spin around that one to get that one. So, so you know, what you consider as being the same, of course, depends on what you choose as your symmetry group. So here the idea is that the symmetry group should really be that one. Now the difference between that symmetry group and something like so it's basically rotations, but it's like rotations at every point. Okay, so at every point you can rotate things in an essentially independent way, as long as you do it so reasonably smoothly. Um, and so of course the big difference is that here the symmetry group is you know, just SO SO3 or SO2, whatever. Um, here the symmetry group is infinite dimensional. Right, so there's an infinite dimensional symmetry here because you can rotate every point of your space manifold in an independent way. Uh, so this is a space of functions, so it's an infinite dimensional set. Okay, and that causes all sorts of problems. So now why does that cause problems? So now what's the okay, so you have this connection. Uh, so first there's a natural action of the symmetry group and you can sort of guess what that action is. If you sort of sit down and work it out, you can kind of guess what the action is because you know, I told you what the interpretation is and then of course now if you act with G on a curve, right, so you've lifted your curve, now you act with G at every point that's going to distort that red curve and then you can sort of you know, reverse engineer that to figure out how you should have changed the definition of A so that if I lifted the blue one, I would get the distorted red curve. Right? So, so, I mean, it's a calculation you can do. It's not very difficult to do. Uh, and so what you figure out is that the action, so the action of G on A is something like, so I'm writing G dot A. It's basically conjugation with G, or add G of A to one. But then there's an extra term, which is something like g times dg inverse. Um, and if you, you know, if you think about it for a little bit, this is of the same, it's of the correct nature. Um, and, well, this gives you also a notion of differentiation, right? Because so since I have now a natural way of identifying points, Right, so if I have a curve on M, I have a natural way of sort of lifting the curve. Um, that also means that I have somehow a natural notion of differentiation where I look at objects that transform somehow in a certain way under the action of that group G, 
Uh, and then I want to differentiate them, but I want to differentiate them sort of, you know, along the lift in some sense rather than along the base curve because the objects would depend also on the uh, on the G component. And so, for example, you get things. So the important one. So let me write covariant derivative. Um, if you have another G value form. B, so B is going to be a G valued <coughs> G valued K form. So K could be zero or one or anything. And then the covariant derivative by definition, if you want, is DB plus A B antisymmetrized in the right way. So it's a form. And so this is the right kind of thing, right? Because if I so this is going to be a k plus 1 form, so db of this you know, is going to be a g value k plus 1 form. Uh, and then this here, you should think of this as being something like a wedge product, but of course these things are g valued, so it's kind of wedge product in terms of component, but then commutator in terms of what happens in g. Right? Uh, and then that does give you the correct thing, because that guy is a 1 form, that's a k form, so if you take the wedge product, you get a k plus 1 form. And in both are G valued and you, you know, take commutate and G, you get again an element of G. So this is sort of well defined and it has an interpretation in terms of essentially differentiating around the lift. And so now this covariant derivative, um, it's slightly different from the usual exterior. So the usual exterior derivative, when you apply it twice, you always get zero. Uh, so here, when you apply it twice, you don't get zero, but you get like a zero-order differential operator. I mean, in the sense that, you see, so this here is a first-order differential operator acting on B, right? Because there's a derivative bit, and there's a kind of zero-order term somehow. Uh, so if you apply it twice, then that a priori is a second-order differential operator. But it turns out that all the derivation bits cancel out, right? Like they do for the normal um, exterior derivative, they cancel out completely, you just get zero. So here all the derivation bits cancel out, but the zero order bits don't. Okay, so what you actually end up is something of the form sum for sum uh, well, g valued two form. FA, and that FA is called the curvature of A. Yeah, so to some extent, it measures by how much that covariant derivative differs from the sort of usual exterior derivative. <coughs> and so now, and of course, all of these things are covariant in the sense that they behave in a nice way under action of that gauge group G. Okay? And so now the Young Mills energy so Young Mills energy is so E of A just going to be a half of you know sort of L2 norm squared of F A. Uh, Okay, sort of L2 norm, you know, you can, there's lots of components, right? So it's like there's the underlying space, but then it's a two form, so you have to kind of choose a good norm on the tangent space, and then it's G valued, so you also have to choose a norm on G. Uh, but of course, the norm on G, you want to choose it in such a way that it's kind of invariant, you know, it's a norm which is invariant on the conjugation by, uh, by the group G, and, you know, since the D group is compact, you have such a norm, and it's basically your D. So, so if one, if you sort of write things down in component and you take as your group S O N and so on, it's just detail that you would naively write down. Okay? So if you don't sort of ask yourself too much questions about what these things do, but well, you actually end up writing down the correct formula. Um, so right, so that's the energy. And okay, so now you would want to, you know, perform the usual thing. So you would want to. So the aim now is to sort of construct 
the young nodes measure. And that should be, in some sense, e to the minus e of a, yeah, whatever, dA, whatever that means. Okay. Um, now, in the <coughs> dimensional case, so we're going to be really interested. So from now on, m is just the two-dimensional tolerance, and I'm also going to assume that this is global somehow rather than local. Um, now, actually, in two dimensions, in some sense, there is a, a proposal exists for this measure. Um, but it's already not even clear what it means. I mean, it's, it's totally not clear in the sense that, um, you see, when you have something like e to the minus that, of course, you know there's problems with randomization and stuff like that, and it's sort of, you know, it probably it's not clear that you get a limit depending on how you approximate it and so on. Uh, here, if you think of it for a second, the, the first impression is that there's absolutely no chance in hell that this has, can have a meaning because, you know, the whole construction was invariant under the action of that infinite dimensional gauge group. So in particular, this energy is invariant under the action of the gauge group. Okay, so it means that if you take two points, two connections, that in some sense, in our mind, are the same connections, or just viewed in a different, different coordinate system. So in the sense that you can find an element of G that maps one to the other one by that formula, um, so you consider them the same. <coughs> Well, then the FA is actually going to be the same, so the EA is actually going to be the same. Okay? So, well, FA is going to be not the same, because, well, there's going to be an action of the G onto the FA, but this action is kind of, you know, this norm is such that it's invariant under that action. Okay? And so the FA is the, the EA is going to be the same. Okay? So what you have is that E of G dot A is equal the e of a for all g and g and for all a. Okay. So that's clear. That's a huge problem, right? Because that means that in some sense your density is kind of flat, but it's flat in the direction of an infinite dimensional kind of subspace of your configuration space, right? Uh, and now this, you know, is really bad because that means that this measure should be something like the bag measure in infinite, there's like infinitely many directions in which it should look like a bag measure, and then there's, okay, the remaining infinitely many directions in which hopefully it behaves sort of more nicely, or it's more like, more like that kind of measure, right? And so of course that's a disaster, yeah, because you know that there's no chance that such a measure exists. Um, and so of course the idea then is to say, well, I mean, actually, of course, we're only interested in physical observables, right? It's now because physical observables, they don't see the action of that group G. Okay? So what you really have is what? So you have some kind of orbit space. So you have these orbits where each orbit is sort of like a copy of G. So that's the space of A's, right? And so you have these orbits under the action of G. Uh, each of these orbits is infinite dimensional. And so this measure, naively written like that, would be something like a Lebesgue measure on each of these orbits. But then, you know, as far as physics is concerned, two points of this, on this orbit, they are really the same point. Okay? And so we really don't care about trying to somehow distinguish them. Right? So we don't actually care about building a measure on this huge space. Uh, we really want to you know, build some kind of orbit space, which would be just a huge space quotiented by the action of G. And so you really want just a measure on that space. Right? So you really want some space of orbits, which would be sort of like the connections quotiented by the action of G. And then you really want to build a measure on that. Um, of course, that's also sort of problematic, because now that, that thing, so first it's really not clear uh, whether this is going to be a nice space, right? So in general, if you have a, 
infinite dimensional group acting on an infinite dimensional space. Even if the action is as nice as you want, the space is as nice as you want, the group is as nice as you want, the quotient might be as bad as you can think of somehow. Okay? Uh, think of you know, think of the stupid example of the group of continuous functions on 0, 1 with addition as the group operation acting on L2 functions on 0, 1 okay, by addition. Okay, so you can add any continuous function to an L2 function, so that's your group action. Okay? And now try to think of what, you, what happens when you do that quotient. Okay? So you want to quotient L2 functions by subtracting continuous functions. So you say two L2 functions are the same if they differ by a continuous function. Of course, that's a horrible equivalence relation. Right? Uh, so if you try to quotient by that, it's going to be, you know, there's absolutely no way you can build measures on that program. It's not going to have any sort of property that you want. Right? It's not going to have any decent topology that allows you to do anything somehow in terms of probability theory. Okay, so you. So there's certainly a non-trivial question here, which is whether you know there's any way of sticking here. I haven't been, I have on purpose not been precise on what topology I want to put on the A's and the G's. Um, a priori, it's not clear. You know, there's a question: Can you put topologies on these guys so that when you form that quotient, you actually get a nice space? Um, and then the other thing you want is you want the space to be such that, well, or in any case, you want so even the space of connections that you start from, I mean, you would want to have somehow sufficiently many observables on that space uh, that are themselves invariant under that group action, because that's like the physical observables. Okay. And so there's a standard class of observables, which is called the Wilson loops. And the Wilson loops are exactly that sort of thing. Okay, So you take an actual loop. Uh, in the base manifold, you lift it, uh, and then you see that, oh, well, where you end up is not necessarily where you started from. You look at the group element that you know, measures by how much you differ, measures the discrepancy, uh, and you take the trace of that. Okay? So you take some, or at least, or you look at the conjugation class if you want inside G. Okay? So the, the thing is that group element by itself is not going to be invariant under the action of G. But the thing is that the way G is going to act on it is just by conjugating uh, with the little g at the, you know, evaluated at that point when you do the loop run. Okay, and so if you just look at the conjugation class or you want like a trace or something like this, <coughs> then you're going to get something which is uh, uh, going to be gauge invariant. So that's called Wilson loops. Uh, and so this would be nice to have Wilson loop observed. Right, so do have a, now, okay. So, so what do you do? Okay. So first we can simply naively, right? So, you, so we would want to construct. Oh yeah. So maybe I should mention that there is a candidate in the sense that you can somehow guess what the Wilson loop of observables would be. So this, in two dimensions, in the free case, which is somehow the one that I've described, uh, and so the, you know, that kind of corresponds to, in some sense, describing back to the meeting stage theory. So you could add matter to this. Uh, and from our point of view, this wouldn't make a big difference. But it would make a big difference from the point of view of this thing being integral of being able to somehow guess the values of observables. So in the free case, um, one can actually guess these Wilson loop of observables. Okay, so there's a construction, so somehow it goes under the name of master field. Mm -hmm. um, so, so if you want, so a Wilson loop is determined by a D loop, right? That's you know, the loop in your configuration space. Um, and uh, so, so you can actually simply write down basically a formula for the joint probability distribution of this. So you take k loops, and then uh, you can write down somehow the joint distribution for the k real value uh, random variables that you get, that you would expect to get under this measure. Okay. So that construction relies very much on essentially being able to guess, a, guess an answer, to have like a closed form 
basically explicit formula on the other side. And so we don't want, so this works only in 2D. So it doesn't work in 3D, there's no known formula. The thing is the wilson lupo observables are very problematic in 3D already to start with. Um, okay, but at least we have a sort of benchmark. Okay, so whatever, if we want to make some sort of other construction, well, you better be able to explain how it relates to the existing construction which happened, which works in a very specific way. Yeah. Okay. So, right, so now what would you want to do to construct that measure? Uh, so, of course, in the stochastic quantization business, well, what you do is you just write down the Longchamp dynamic for this, and then you say, oh, the measure is just being done in measure for that thing. So here you would want to write down the long dynamic and you get something like this. Um, so the long dynamic. We get to the PTA is equal to minus basically the adjoint. So with the adjoint of that covariant derivative operation applied to F A and then plus no. And that's essentially what you get if you take some kind of functional derivative of that thing. Uh, and then you add noise here. So this is just space-time white noise, but it's now space-time white noise, which is like a G value, you know, well G value then one form. It's like a G value one form type of white noise, okay? But it's still just basically a space-time white noise. Uh, okay, so that's the equation you get. Um, but now if you, and this has sort of explicit formulas in terms of like, okay, you can just write down a formula that looks a bit hard, you can write it down. Um, if you look at the formula you get, what you see is that it actually doesn't look like an elliptic operator, okay? So it somehow looks like a, so but it, there is a second order differential operator acting on A, and then there's some nonlinear bits. So it somehow does look semi-linear. Uh, but if you look at that second order differential operator, you see that it's actually degenerate. Okay, so it's not uh, mobility. So then that's bad. Um, but so now, and then you know, of course that's what you expect, right? Because if you formally write down that Nozma equation, it means that in some sense in these directions here. Well, there's no drift, right? So like the drift is like the gradient flow. It's going to kind of move on in this direction. And so in these directions, there's going, but that's still infinitely many directions, right? So there's somehow, in some sense, like half of your space in which there should be kind of no drift. And so that means in particular, there shouldn't be like a linear operator that acts in this direction, okay? Uh, and so that's basically the reason why this ends up being degenerate. But then on the other hand, we said that in this direction, we don't really care about what happens. Right? So the idea is to say, well, I could actually add, right? So now that gives me, formally, it gives me some sort of dynamic here in that space of connections. Um, but now you could say, well, you know, if I actually change that equation and I change it in such a way that, you know, you just add bits that kind of move in this direction here, then, as far as physics is concerned, I haven't changed anything, right? Because I consider things that are on the same orbit, I consider them as being the same anyway. So if I just add an extra drift that moves along the orbit, that's not going to change anything, okay? So that changes nothing. Uh, and so if you do the calculation of what it means to sort of move in the direction of the orbit, you see that you can actually basically take anything of that form, where this is sort of H is any function of A, which should be, well, you know, this guy should be a g-valued one form. This is a derivative, so this should really just be a g-valued function. Right? So that should be sort of like a g-valued zero form function. Okay, so, any, so you take any h that turns your g-valued one form into a g-valued zero form, and you can add a term like that, and formally, it just means adding a drift that moves in this direction, but it actually changes nothing. Again, of course, that's a trick that has been realized a long time ago. Um, and that works in other geometric PDs, okay? So that trick was actually first introduced by the Turk um, in the early 80s in order to, I think it was for Ricci flow that he introduced it. Um, 
And then uh, Donaldson, somehow a bit later, kind of reused the Turk's trick in the context of Young Mills. And so what Donaldson <coughs> proposed is to say, oh, I should actually take H of A to be minus DA star A. Okay, DA star A, well, you know, it's something this guy lowers by one, so this is a one form, this gives you a zero form. So this at least gives you the right sort of object. And it has a chance of being nice, right? Because it's going, so that means now I put here a minus DA, DA star A. You know, that looks, Nice. Right? I mean, in the sense that it's a second order thing, it has the right sign, so that's going to kind of improve ellipticity of this bit. Um, and indeed, if you do that, then it actually looks like a perfectly nice semi-linear elliptic kind of, well, parabolic PD. So then it actually looks like that. It actually looks like uh, the plasion of A, uh, and then there's extra bits. I don't want to write down the whole thing. And actually, I haven't written down my notes, and so I'm not even able to write down the whole thing because I don't remember it. Um, but I can give you some. The flavor of it is that there's going to be basically some terms that look like kind of A, D bracket with DA, and there's going to be some terms that look like sort of some triple iterated B bracket. Right? So there's going to be terms like that. And then you just have to fiddle around with the indices to you know, combine the indices in the right way and put the right numerical factors in front. Okay, but basically it looks like that, and the precise constants are kind of irrelevant for part of the discussion, but they are extremely relevant for other parts of the discussion. Okay, so you end up with that. So, so now you have basically two questions that we're answering in that work. Um, so the first question, so this, this is precisely of the form of the type of equations you can deal with with regularity structures. Of, um, it's about just sort of at the borderline. Well, in two dimensions, it's actually kind of nice. In three dimensions, it's getting kind of close to the borderline of what you can deal with, but it's still fine. It actually becomes pretty cool in dimension four which is consistent with the fact that you can earn a million dollars if you understand what happens in dimension four. So, so we're probably very far from earning a million dollars. Um, but anyway, dimension two is perfectly, perfectly nice. It's kind of clear. You can normalize that thing, you get a solution. Okay. Now, this is potentially a huge problem. Because you see, so what did I say? I just said, oh, you renormalize it and you get a solution. Of course, we normalize it, meaning kind of changing the equation. Okay. But now, this equation, as written here, is supposed to have some kind of gauge invariance property. So it's, good. it's supposed to be gauge equivariant in the following sense, in the sense that if I start from A, and I run the solution to this equation, um, and then I take a different starting point, say G applied to A, and I run the solution starting from here, then, in law, they are supposed to be the same modulo action of G. Okay? Uh, and that's supposed to be true. You can convince there's a formula, there's a formal calculation you can do, sort of if you believe that, you know, white noise is sort of invariant on orthogonal uh, transformations, then you can kind of see that that's the case for this equation. Okay? So it sort of has that kind of invariance property or equivariance property. But now, if you renormalize it, what does it mean? So it means you sort of modify that thing, and then you add some kind of counter terms uh, that make it converge. But now, these things are extremely rigid. So basically, whatever you add here is going to break that equivariance property. Right? Uh, and then you're basically dead. So it means that you've constructed something which has clearly absolutely nothing to do uh, with what you want. Okay? And so you definitely want to keep that property. That's why right, really the thing that sort of right, you want to build a gauge theory, you have to have gauge invariance, otherwise you haven't built a gauge theory. Okay. Um, so so now okay, so you could maybe first you could try to be super optimistic and you say, oh maybe 
the structure of the term here is just such that if I compute all these randomization constants, maybe actually just all magically cancel out and I can manage to get a limit without doing any randomization. It sometimes happens. Right? So I don't know if you heard maybe either Lorenzo or me talking about this paper with the loops on the manifold. There exactly that happens. Um, well, here it doesn't. <laughs> okay, so it just doesn't. I mean, you can do the calculation, you can actually so if you compute the in two dimensions, it's all sufficiently simple, so you can actually just compute everything. Uh, and what you find is that, well, you have to add a term like that, some sort of mass term. Um, and this constant really does diverge logarithmically. I mean, you can actually just, you can, you know, if you have enough stamina, you can actually compute the prefactor of the logarithmic divergence, and it's a number, and the number is not zero. Okay, you can actually compute the number. Okay, so this thing does actually diverge. It's really there. So you can't do it. If you remove it, it just doesn't converge for anything. Uh, okay, so then you think, well, that's, that's really trouble. Until you realize that, well, what you've done here is you've modified the noise. So actually, in some sense, the formal calculation that shows that these things are gauge equivalent it kind of relies on the fact that if psi is white noise, then G psi G inverse, or if you want add G applied to psi, is also white noise. Okay, so it sort of relies on the fact that Gaussian measures are invariant on the rotation. This is basically like the rotation of the point wise or something. Right. Okay. But this relies very much on the fact that this is white. In the sense that white noise, you are allowed to rotate it independently at every point in any way you want, then you get the same thing. When you modify it, it's not white anymore. So this is actually not true anymore. Okay? So what you end up doing by doing this is you kind of break gauge, gauge invariance in two ways. You sort of break it because you add this term, but you also break it because you modify the noise. Because that already breaks that. Right? So this here is equal in law to that, but this is not equal in law to that. If you work on a lattice, do you preserve it? Or? Yeah, so on the lattice, because you can do it, yeah. So if you do everything on the lattice, then white is still white somehow, because things will be independent on the lattice. Yeah. Um, okay, and so then, because you get a bit more optimistic again, right? so you say, oh, maybe these two things, both of them look like they're kind of breaking gauge at the back equivariance, but maybe they kind of combine in such a way that precisely they don't break it. Now, of course, at fixed epsilon, they do break it, whatever. I mean, there's just no way around it, but then maybe you think, oh, but maybe in the limit they don't. Okay, so maybe you actually recover it in the limit. Um, and that's one of our theorems. Okay, so the main, so one of our main results, so we have sort of two main results, so I have five minutes for the main results. Um, so one main result is that precisely you can choose the constant, and there's a unique way of choosing the constant in such a way that gauge invariance is preserved in the limit. Okay, so that this guy, so you have a epsilon, so there's basically a unique choice of C epsilon such that on the one hand, A epsilon converges to some limit A as epsilon goes to zero. And on the other hand, A is gauge equivariant. Okay, and so it's gauge equivariant in the sense that I explained here, in the sense that if you take the limiting mark, so the limiting thing is a Markov process on that space of uh, connections. So of course a very singular space, because this thing is white noise, so it's going to be sort of distributional type of connections. Right? Um, but it's a Markov process on that space, and it has exactly that property. So it has the property that if you start from two points that differ by an action of the gauge group, uh, then, well, there's two ways of interpreting it. So the way we prove it is that then there's basically, you can find a random gauge transformation that pathwise kind of maps one solution to the other one. Okay, so that's maybe the strongest way to say the, the thing. Um, okay, so you can find, right, so in some sense, so you have an A, so you have a B here, 
Okay, so then you get two processes. You get your A of T, you get your B of T, okay? And what we're saying is that you can find a G of T, which is going to be random also, such that B of T is equal to G of T acting on A of T, almost surely, um, simultaneously for T, so until body will blow up and, you know, so technical stuff. Um, but basically, okay, so you can show KJ covariance in that sense. Um, and this actually seems that is also true in 3D. So we can do that in 3D. At least we think so. In 3D, yeah. so in 2D, in 2D you can kind of compute that explicitly. In 3D you can't, uh, so you have to rely on different. I mean, you can in theory, but it becomes so horrible that basically you can't. Um, so you have to rely on smart arguments. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, but then, you know, if you really want to... Okay, so, so one thing is you could say, well, okay, so maybe that guy has an invariant measure. It's not clear that that guy has an invariant measure. Okay, so there's no reason a priori, even if you believe that this measure exists, and you certainly should believe that in 2D, uh, so even if you believe that, that wouldn't guarantee that that guy has an invariant measure. Because you could very well be in a situation where this guy sort of blows up a long gauge orbit. So, so the second result is that at least that doesn't happen. Okay, so we can, well, at least we can tweak the process in such a way that that doesn't happen. Okay, but we can tweak it in such a way that this doesn't happen, and that the thing that you get is still KJ covariant to the thing that you started from, at least until the thing you started from goes up, because that might happen. Um, Okay, and then there was this business of actually having a decent state space for the measure, right, with the observables and stuff. So, so there's a there's a previous paper by Ilya where he kind of cons constructs some kind of state space, um, but it's well, okay, it's somehow. A bit unusual in the sense that it's a, for example, it's a space which is a priori not even invariant under kind of rotations of the torus or things like that. So it kind of makes use of specific, there's like two unit vectors on the torus and it sees these two directions and they're special. Um, so, so what we show is we can, uh, we can define spaces let me call them, say, omega alpha of uh, distributional uh, say, say, g value one forms such that um, well, so first these guys are kind of distributed, so here alpha going to be between two-thirds and one. Yeah. It's alpha between two-thirds and one, but you should think of that guy as really having regularity alpha minus one. Okay, so in the sense that there's a projection omega alpha to C alpha minus one. I mean, in fact, forms so that every component is of that regularity. Okay. Um, so they are kind of a regularity alpha minus one. But of course, if it, but they are they have more structure than that. Okay, so of course this this space is much smaller than that uh, because in particular they're good enough so you can restrict them on like two lines. Okay, so an arbitrary distribution of negative degree you cannot restrict it to a line, uh, but something like a free field in dimension two, which is roughly what these things are supposed to look like, you can restrict it to a line. Okay, and so you want to have a space of things that have the kind of regularity of a free field, but that you can restrict to a line. And so they can be restricted to lines. And so they can actually be restricted to curves um, that are regular enough. 
So, and there's actually, so there's a funny thing we, that kind of came up here. I don't know if that's known. Uh, so regular enough here means it's basically somewhere between C1 and C2. Uh, but there's a way of measuring the regularity which is independent of the parametrization of the curve. So it's kind of a version of between C1 and C2, which is parametrization independent, which is kind of fun. So it's a, a little bit like a p-variation thing. But p-variation works between 0 and 1. Right? So p-variation, a curve being of finite p-variation, is essentially the same as being C alpha modulo reparametrization for alpha equal 1 over p. Uh, and so that works for alpha between 0 and 1. So we, here we have some sort of version of p-variation, but that works between 1 and 2. <laughs> Uh, instead of between 0 and 1. And so the way you measure regularity is not by, right? So in p variation, you take your curve and you sort of look at sizes of increments. You take increments and then you look at the sizes and you add up the increments to some power. So here what you do is you look at sizes of triangles, right? So you take sort of like for any two points, for any two points, you look at the biggest triangle that you can form with any third point in between, biggest in terms of area, okay? And then you look at that triangle, and you take the area of that triangle to the power half, so it turns it into a length. Uh, and then you do something like p-variation, but with that, instead of with the actual lengths, okay? Uh, and then that, that's parametrization independent, obviously, in exactly the same way that p-variation is parametrization independent. Um, and if you, well, you can do a calculation, and so there's an embedding of if a, if a curve is sort of like C, C beta for beta between 1 and 2, then it actually embeds into things that are sort of p variation in, itself, in that sense for a certain value of p. There's a, word, uh, there's a formula that relates the two. Uh, but anyway, so, so this is somehow the natural notion of regularity here that guarantees that these things. <coughs> Uh, can be restricted to these kind of curves. And so in particular, we have Wilson loop observables for loops that have that type of regularity. Okay. Um, and then, okay, so I'm out of time. So maybe just the last thing I want to show is that actually we can really characterize, so we can actually really build a space like this. Okay. So you have a, so here you have this omega alpha, and here you take G alpha, which is basically the alpha holder uh, you know, elements in the gauge group uh, with a tiny subtlety, but it's essentially alpha holder just. Uh, and then the claim is that that quotient is actually really nicely behaved. Okay, so we can show that that quotient is actually a Polish space. Um, and you, know, you can write down a distance function for it, somewhat explicitly. Orbits are closed, uh, so that's not obvious in general. So orbits are closed, and the quotient space is a perfectly nice Polish space. And so you can actually, from that SPD, so then since you have that gauge equivariance, that actually allows you to actually build a Markov process on that space. Right? So at the end of the day, uh, you really build an actual Markov process on this space of orbits. Um, and at least formally, it certainly looks like, right, so I mentioned at the very beginning that there should be some sort of reality check because we have a benchmark. We already have a candidate measure for this Wilson group observables. And so then you would want that our measure actually coincides with that measure. Um, and so this uh, we haven't proven. We believe, we said, well, we certainly believe that it's true. Um, a way of proving it would be exactly as Trish was saying, somehow to go through the uh, lattice gauge. Theory, right? So you can, uh, you can build some sort of lattice gauge theory that approximates this. And so if you had a good general result that gives you convergence of approximate equations to that thing, then you would essentially be done. And you, could, uh, you could actually prove that the two coincide. So it's actually, I mean, it's. You know, like with 99% confidence that it's really good. So, okay. I think that's about here.